everyone and uh, welcome. I'm Janan Atilgan from the German Konrad Adenauer Stiftung based in uh, Berlin and together with uh, Vivian Yi from New York Times, we have the great pleasure to moderate uh, this session. And I think this is um, a perfect follow-up to the previous conversation with Commissioner uh, Varheli. Um, well, we have a very powerful panel of uh, speakers. I want to warmly welcome Minister of Foreign Affairs of Malta, Mr. Evarist Bartolo. I uh, want to welcome also uh, Michael Spindelegger, former Vice Chancellor of Aus Austria and currently the Director General of the, of the International Center for Migration Policy Development. And virtually we are joined Yes, uh, by Director General of the International Organization for Migration, Antonio Vittorino, and by Minister of Foreign Affairs of Libya, Najla El Mangush. So welcome once again. We have exactly one hour for our uh, conversation, for our discussion, and ideally, this will be more of a conversation than a sequence of presentations. Um, let me just kickstart the panel with um, a bold statement um, in order to provoke thoughts and uh, discussions. So there is a common sense, a general common sense that migration is a transnational issue and requires cooperative responses. The EU indeed has developed or formulated very ambitious strategies, uh, put in place action plans and cooperative initiatives, but there is the bleak reality. And this is about a political climate of polarization, of increasing tensions between uh, EU members and with neighboring countries. So overall, a climate that hampers cooperation and partnership. And meanwhile, meanwhile a pattern has emerged. So we have the, the growing numbers of migrants and refugees, and Europe and other countries have restored um, increasingly harsh methods to keep those migrants away. And in turn, gateway countries use the threat of mass, mass migration for political and financial gains or other concessions uh, from Europe. So we have a situation where migration has become a matter of not policy and diplomacy, uh, but of coercion, blackmail, and bad deeds. So with this thought, I want to hand over to Vivian to start uh, the discussion. Thank you. Well, the first question is actually for the Foreign Minister of Libya, since um, this is a country really at the center of this issue. And so we'd like to ask you about um, EU cooperation with Libya and the way in which this cooperation has resulted in, uh, as is commonly acknowledged, massive human rights violations um, in detention centers of migrants in Libya. It's resulted in uh, destabilizing <coughs> Libya itself and, and contributing to the uh, fragmentation and, and violence there. Um, it, it is, of course, a huge burden on Libya um, for taking in all of these migrants and uh, doing a service to the EU, basically, of, of keeping them from crossing. Um, and so we wanted you to address uh, what could each side of this, this partnership do differently? Um, is the EU focusing on mi migration at the expense of other issues and actually ignoring issues important to Libyan stability? And in turn, what could, what could Libya do to um, address the human rights violations that, that we all know are there? 
Well, thank you for the question. First of all, uh, good afternoon for everyone. Good to see my dear friend Everest in the panel and uh, thanks for the mediators and uh, big thank to my dear friend uh, Luigi Di Maio. Uh, I regret not to be in Rome, but uh, you know, I have just uh, some commitments that require to, uh, to be present here. Uh, well, the immigration issues is a very complicated and multi-layer problem. Uh, we are gathered to talk about very hot topic. Uh, perhaps it's the most significant topic. Um, some countries in Europe are eager to support Libya and get it politically stabilized for the sole purpose of stopping uh, the influx of immigrants. Uh, we get that, but we understand that the significance of these issues for these countries, we understand how big is inconvenience. Uh, but I have said all the time since the beginning and uh, on always with my dear friends, but also with other countries, uh, let's not ignore how problematic the issue is for Libya in the first place. Uh, please do not push the problem in our lab and please don't point your fingers at Libya and portray us as a country which abuse and disrespect refugees. I repeat the problem is bigger and uh, multi-layer and very complex. Uh, I know you do not like to hear it, but it's the truth. We are tired of beating around the bush. Uh, and all these superficial solutions um, being offered, it's time to state the problem and uh, and face it instead of like uh, keep repeating it again and again. In a uh, different language, uh, only last week there is 27 immigrants uh, drawn to crossing the English Channel from France to Britain. Uh, humans' lives are valuable for everyone. But I, I look at it and I think if two of the most stable countries in the world using the most advanced uh, surveillance, search and rescue uh, technologies in the world, if they cannot control illegal immigration, uh, how are we in Libya with the situation we are facing and we're still going through, how we expect to control it? It's a big question that require deep thinking and require a better understanding to the situation in the ground. Libya uh, is not the final destination for those immigrants. Uh, we are a transit country. Some of the immigrants who claim to be seeking refugee in Libya actually come from countries which are more stable and peaceful than our country. They come to us knowing full well that we cannot provide for their safety. They know that we cannot guarantee the respect of their well-deserved human rights. They know that they may be subject to the control of outlaws and smuggles. They are very aware of the sad situation in our country, but still they come. I'm not blaming them, but I'm just trying to put the matter in realistic context. So again, you know, I think the solutions uh, answering the, qu the questions of uh, Vivian uh, are, uh, have been always provided, but I think it's always been superficial, just to be honest. They were uh, just uh, for the cause of serving uh, the agenda of the EU and the perspective of the EU. It wasn't actually uh, in a deep matter to understand the problematic without it. What really, really you know, and what really, really we need, just to make it short and make it uh, clear, uh, I, I, I wish this event uh, where a lot of people, they are interested and they are willing to uh, understand the situation, but also to implement strategies that are more useful and sufficient, that we had enough talk in the media by uh, our European partners about how much money was given to Libya to stop uh, illegal immigration. All of that did not help in the past and will never help in the future. We Libyans know how to fix this problem. We understand it very well. So please listen to us when we tell what we really need. Because what we need is very clear and very easy to think about and implement. We need vetting immigrants at our southern borders in ways which respect their dignity and human rights. And we need surveillance technology that help us to secure our borders. So for example, if we think about our sharing borders between us and Chad, it's more than 1000 kilometers. Just think about it in the desert in that difficult circumstances and environment, how we can secure the borders with this cap capacity and with this limited resources. Above that, with the security situation in the ground. So I hope this is answering your question. Thank you. Thank you.
you, uh, Minister Manguch. As I understand, you won't be able to stay with us uh, for uh, yes. the um, remaining uh, discussions, but that was a very powerful uh, uh, statement, and I think you sort of set the scene for our uh, debate now. Well, thank you so much. Uh, you know, again, I would love to hear the rest of the conversation, but uh, I, I thought it's very important just to highlight uh, the main themes, the main concepts that we are sharing to today. And I hope, I believe, my dear Everest and uh, Luigi, both of us at the same boat, and they, uh, they understand the complexity of the picture and that this matter is really global crisis that need to be uh, understood in a, in a different way so we can solve these issues. And thank you so much for your deep listening and for inviting me. Thank you. Thank you for Thank Minister you. Mangush. Thank um, you. Bye. <laughs> we, we turn now to the Director General of the International Organization for Migration, uh, Mr. Vittorino. And um, we would like you to further set the table for us in terms of giving us um, a picture of how things have changed um, in the migration picture across the Mediterranean since the advent of COVID-19, which, as we know, has changed so many things throughout the world. Um, and undoubtedly it's changed migration as well. Uh, so give us a picture there and, and tell us what should the EU be, be doing about it? Um, is, the, is the current you know, status quo of that, that the, the foreign minister of Libya just described, um, is that actually discouraging anyone from crossing the Mediterranean uh, or are we looking for new solutions? And what, what real non-superficial solutions, as she mentioned, um, could there actually be to this problem? Hello, good afternoon. Thank you so much for the invitation. I regret very much not being able to join you uh, in uh, Rome, being here in uh, freezing uh, Geneva. Yes, indeed, uh, the pandemic uh, has uh, put the world to a halt. It had never happened in the past, but it did not prevent migrants to go on moving. I would say that there are three main concerns. The first one, we register roughly 3 million migrants that have been stranded because of border closures, because of uh, lockdowns, because of the cancellation of flights, mainly in the MENA region and in Southeast Asia. The second point is that we register more than 100,000 100, travel restrictions because of the pandemic, and now that we are witnessing a fourth wave and or a fifth wave, we are witnessing uh, the reinstatement of uh, closures of borders or travel restrictions. All that has an enormous impact in the capacity of migrants to move, particularly those who want to move regularly. And thirdly, I would say that uh, the pandemic has hit hardest those were more vulnerable in the societies. And migrants, asylum seekers, and uh, refugees are, by definition, the weakest link in the chain in our uh, societies. But if you want to focus on the impacts of the pandemic in the uh, migratory flows, I would say to you that uh, the impact has been very much uneven. There has been a sharp drop of arrivals to Europe in the Eastern Mediterranean route. But there has been a rise in Central Mediterranean, not just a rise as far as arrivals are concerned, but also a rise on the numbers of the migrants that were uh, rescued by the Libyan Coast Guard and brought back to Libya, as well as a rise, unfortunately, in the deaths of people in Central Mediterranean. In 2021, we registered three times more deaths in the Central Mediterranean route than last year. If you look to the Western Mediterranean, the figures are more or less the same in 2020 as they were before the pandemic, but there is a new massive flow of migrants towards the Atlantic route in direction to the Canary Islands. So this shows to you that uh, the reality of migration prevails over the impacts of the pandemic and the flows persist in spite of the fact that they do not behave the same way everywhere. 
Our utmost concerns today deal with uh, the need to integrate uh, migrants in the national vaccination plans. And this is a daring task, but as the Secretary General of the United Nations has very clearly stated, no one is safe until everybody is safe. And uh, from the 122 countries that have included migrants in their national vaccination plans, that's very much welcome, 67 of uh, them only uh, include regular migrants. Those who are in an irregular situation are not included in national vaccination plans. And potentially, they can give birth to variants as we are witnessing uh, today. And 55 countries all over the world just purely do not include migrants irrespective of their legal status in their national vaccination plans. So the challenge for the future, in my view, is that we need to bring together smart, humane, human rights-centered border management with health, security, and safety mechanisms. And this will require cooperation, partnership, partnership between countries of origin, countries of transit, and countries of destination. This will require investment in infrastructures that uh, make possible for countries to guarantee the effective control of the health safety of the people on the move. And this will also require an upgrade in the capacity of the border guards and the immigration officials to deal with health proofing mechanisms. It's a daring agenda. And I think that the European Union has a particular responsibility to share the knowledge and the capacity with the countries of transit and, des and origin, most particularly with the African countries. From our side, IOM, together with the UNHCR, we are engaged in a tripartite approach with the African Union and with the European Union, as far as Libya is concerned, in order to address the challenges that the Libyan authorities are confronted with the migratory flows. And I fully subscribe what the minister has just said. We need to look each time more and more to the Libya southern border. We tend, and the media also tend very much to focus, on the situation at the shores, because those are the departing points towards Europe. But we need to have a route approach to the migratory flows in Libya. And most of the migrants come from sub-Saharan Africa, and they come through the Libyan desert, through the southern part of Libya. And that's where there is an urgent need, not just to improve the border control capacity in South Libya, but also to stabilize the communities in the southern part of Libya so that migration can be regulated. There you have, in a nutshell, what is my take, and I hope to have answered your question. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Vittorino. Uh, did I understand correctly you're staying with us for the next uh, couple of minutes? Yes, a few more minutes because I have another meeting on this same issue with New York. I'm sorry. Okay, don't you worry. So we will now, but first, turn uh, to Europe. Uh, Minister Bartolo, mm. uh, I mean, we have now listened uh, from Mr. Vittorino. The root causes of uh, migration are very diverse and very dynamic. They even become more dynamic with uh, the pandemic that increases uh, inequality, poverty, and instability. The same applies for the routes, for the routes that migrants take. They're also very diverse and dynamic. And Malta, as um, a European frontline country in the middle of the Mediterranean, has so far advocated a more holistic approach uh, to migration. But after so many years, I remember the first, one of the first significant uh, steps um, has been taken in Valletta 2016. Um, but still the EU migration policy is very much unfinished business. What's your take on this? Well, first of all, the relationship between 
the European Union and uh, African countries, including Libya, is unfortunately part of the present, I would call, political economic crisis that we have. We, we talk about global warming as a climate crisis. I think we should start talking much more and also doing something about it. The climate crisis that we have in politics and the same steps that we are taking to take that crisis out, the relationship right now between different countries is, is, is toxic, is, is really a lot of hostility, a lot of distrust, a lot of division. And that is also affecting the relationship between Europe and uh, North Africa and Africa. We also have COVID in politics, uh, but to solve it, we need to take away the masks and we need to have no distancing and get together. Um, but then I think, and I, I agree completely with Minister Mangush, the way we engage with, uh, with the Libyans and with the other North African countries, I think is mistaken. I think there is still a ha colonial hangover. I think there is still a complex of superiority. Uh, we talk, we talk to them, or we talk at them, and we don't listen. And uh, listening is very important. And I think we should have some humility to reset our relations and to listen and have a common agenda, not simply go and push our agenda onto them, looking only at our selfish reason. We have to look at this issue, first of all, in a much wider perspective. You can, we keep on discussing migration as a standalone. Migration is not a standalone. Migration is not the cause. Migration is an effect. We need to look at it in terms of economic development, social development, people mostly move because they don't want to stay where they are because they are passing through a very bad time. So we need to, um, you know, we need to address the root causes and uh, I don't see us uh, doing that. And we need to do that. We need to look at migration in a very serious manner and at the same time have a sense of proportion. We forget that there are only 10% in the world of the people on the move who are coming to Europe. 90% are in Africa, in Latin America, in Asia. They are in neighboring countries. It's as if we behave as if it's the other way around, as if 90% are coming to Europe and 10% are remaining in the rest of the continent, which is not the case, which is not true. And then this demonization of migrants uh, as if they are the cause of all the problems that we have, and I think it's, uh, it's, uh, it's terrible. I mean, I mean the, the, the kind of dialogue that we have, which I don't call it a dialogue, it's a monologue preaching self-righteously to, you know, telling these countries what they need to do. We need to listen to them. We need to put this issue in a, in a wider context and have the humility that most of the problems that we think are caused by these African and North African countries are after all, most of them created by European countries, have been created by European countries over different centuries. You know, uh, even if we look at the situation in, in Libya, only Obama has had the decency to say that the NATO military intervention was terrible, that it was yes, take away Gaddafi, and then what happens after, what happens after? You know, so yes, the war was won, but the peace has been lost and we're still picking up the pieces. So I, th I think we really need to look, take a good look at ourselves, admit our shortcomings. There is a lot to do and which can be done. L uh, the European Union throws a lot of money over there. Just throwing money is not enough, it's important. But how to spend it? Uh, just one point and, and I'll stop here. And again, Minister Mangush was very clear, and I think even Mr. Vittorino was very clear about this. We think that the southern border of the European Union is Spain, Italy, Malta. The southern border of the European Union is in Fezzan. It's the southern border that Libya has with Chad and, and with Sudan and with the other countries. And we think that we are going to solve the problem by stopping people from leaving the, the coast. First of all, we should look at what is happening in Africa and have decent economic relations with Africa, not to create more imbalance. 
because we take everything away from Africa, illicit funds, profits, resources. We are also now very, very happily saying that we have a talent partnership program to take away their best brains and to take away their best talent. Then at the same time, we expect them to create wealth, to create jobs, when the demographic balance between Europe and Africa is one is to eight. For every baby born in Europe, eight are born in Africa. Where are the jobs going to come from? Where is the economic development going to come from? If we keep on exporting manufactured products to them and importing only primary products, so really migration has to be looked at within a social, economic, political, cultural perspective. Until we start doing that, people will keep on drowning in the Mediterranean, people will keep on being, being you know, treated, treated badly, but we need to sit down with humility and not talk only and write that we want to be equal partners. Think differently, talk differently, listen and behave differently. Then we will start getting to grips with this issue. Um, Mr. Spindelegger, uh, Mr. Bartolo repeatedly said we need to talk to our neighbors on the same eye level. We need to better cooperate and we should stop looking at migration as a threat to Europe. So now the question to you is how to get the or all European Union member states on board for such an ambitious goal? That's an interesting question, of course. <laughs> Thank you very much for that, uh, because there is not one single answer to that. Of course, you have to see that uh, this picture of migration is not black and white. And I think more and more European states understand that. And uh, if you look back one year, Poland never would have been th thinking that they will get uh, on their border side such uh, a migration flow from Belarus. So you are never safe because uh, flows are changing. They are going to different directions and you have to look forward what is the overall concept. And I think with that, uh, we have to look what do we mean by partnership? As Minister Bartolo said, uh, I think the first element for real partnership is uh, to look what is the common understanding of the situation. And this means not only to look from your eyes to the issues, but also to look through the eyes of your counterpart and to find a common agenda. If you have that, you need the second element. And this is to have a permanent political dialogue. Because if you are just sitting once together and finding uh, maybe an answer to one of the issues, you will not find uh, really satisfaction with that. You need to sit down regularly and you have to look always what are the challenges today and tomorrow and uh, what can we do with that. And the third element is then the implementation. Also this is most important because uh, finding uh, an answer is not enough. You need to find programs and projects, how to deal with that in practice so that something can change on the ground. And I totally agree what Minister Patolo said we have to look to the countries of origin. We have to find a real migration partnership uh, with different elements. And this is always about how to fight together against irregular migration. I think this is needed because nobody can be satisfied with irregular migration. For that, you need uh, uh, much uh, speedier uh, procedures just to look if somebody needs protection or not and uh, also the consequence if somebody uh, is rejected and is not an, a real asylum seeker, how to bring them back, return is an issue. But on the other side, you also need to look what are the legal pathways. How can you come uh, on a legal way to work for a certain period in Europe? Uh, and I think with that, there is a need for more discussion um, among all the different members of European Union. But I think uh, we have to look uh, at this. Uh, there are some efforts because nowadays everybody, I think, agrees 
that we have to fight together against irregular migration and that we have to find uh, also good solutions in a partnership with the countries of origin. Thank you for that, uh, Mr. Spindegger. Um, so, Spindelegger, excuse me. So, you actually segued perfectly into our next topic, which is how, how do we support um, alternative, you know, regular pathways to migration? We've talked about this for years, nothing ever comes of it. What are some, I mean, are, are there in, innovative solutions that, that either of you see um, anywhere in the EU where, where things are already moving on this front, or is it all paralyzed? And uh, if, if there are no solutions so far, what, what could we be doing better in order to facilitate migration for economic purposes, where Europe needs these migrants for jobs and for labor? Um, what could we be doing better? Mm -hmm. If I may start, Mr. Minister, uh, I give you one concrete example. Uh, I think uh, you have to try out. This is not one solution for every country. You have to look what you could do concretely in one of these partnerships with specific countries. So what we have uh, been doing and what we are doing at the moment as ICMPD is uh, to work for special relationship between countries. In my example, it is Austria together with Nigeria because we had a situation that uh, so many Nigerians came to Austria asking for asylum and were rejected at the end. So uh, the question was how to bring them back and what to do so that uh, we really have a good partnership. So what we created together with Nigeria was to find Austrian enterprises that are ready to uh, invest in Nigeria special part where many of the migrants come from, and then to give public money from the taxpayer to train people in Nigeria that they can work, especially for these enterprises, because it is not possible if you are also a student at the university, you will not be in the position to work for a European enterprise immediately. You need special skills. So we started uh, with that. And um, at the end, of course, we will not just train the people working for these enterprises. We will uh, put also a third element, and this is a startup center. So if people have got r the special skills as a plumber or, uh, I don't know, electrician, then they should also be in the position to start their own business uh, with a uh, special uh, loan. And then, of course, something could uh, start in the country with uh, more workplaces. And just to, to make the story short, with that project, we brought a very better understanding between the states. And now, of course, also this return from people that are not accepted as uh, asylum seekers in Austria to Nigeria is working perfectly. And with that, uh, I think the whole relationship has changed. And I think something like that, you cannot duplicate uh, with every country, but you can start uh, to think, especially for the needs of two countries and how to find a solution in a new way, especially involving the private sector. I, I think I, I agree totally with what you're saying. There isn't a one size fits all. Every country, uh, not even country, more than country, every case has to be seen specifically and design and design a program for it. Definitely. The return program, so I think what is important, and it's already happening with some countries, that you have a good agreement with sending countries, like I'll take Malta, for example, our relations with uh, Egypt, with uh, Ghana, with um, Morocco, I'll just take those three examples, there are other examples, and we have a relationship which says, listen, we need regular people, we need regular migrants, and just to give you a, an idea in Malta, we create about, remember that we're talking about a, a country with less than half a million people. We create 11,000 jobs a year, of which the Maltese can only fill four, because our birth rate is the lowest in, in Europe. Uh, from being the highest, it went to being the lowest in, in a century. Uh, so we need people from overseas, I mean, to, to fill 7,000 7, jobs practically a year. So we told them, listen, we need people, but let's let them come on a regular, through regular routes, through regular routes. 
we have some irregular citizens from our side, uh, take them back and send us the regular ones. But that is only part of the story. And this is where our return programs need to be different, where they need also to have the component of training, as you're saying, so that when they go back, they are reintegrated in the labor market, because otherwise we know what has happened. We have had return programs where they go back and then basically, I've been told, cross the street and with the money that they have been given to go back, start preparing to come again. Because if they are not reintegrated in the labor market, they will, they will come back, they will come back. I think we should also look very much at the Spanish-Moroccan reality. There for years now, so, so there is good practice to follow. For at least 30 years, there have been very strong programs uh, for um, circular, circular uh, migration where people come, they do their work, they are in the official labor market, they are paid decently, they do their job, go back, and know that they come, can come back again. So I think, yes, there are, there are things that we can do. And I think now, that is why we cannot see this. I think we have to be strategic about this. And that is why we should align policies together. Trade policies, financial policies, employment policies, and migration policies. Not working in silos differently, even within the EU. These structures need to work together. So for example now, and the pandemic has shown this, we need, and it's fashionably now being called nearshoring. We need to get work that has been going on in Asia as part of the production process of factories located in Europe. We need to start bringing them to Africa. Obviously, we have to see which sectors these are you know, where this would be possible and start doing it. But then we need to do it as a policy. I know that it's already happening. There are individual factories that have already started getting their operation from Asia, part of their operation from Asia to North Africa. And what they were waiting for seven weeks before, now they can do it in four days. The quality of the work is good and the price is even better. So that is why it's important not to see migration on its own. And as we are saying that near shoring is going to be so important, let's do it. Let's do it because like that, it's a, this is a win-win because it's a win for our companies, for our countries, and also for these countries where, where, we will create, where we will create jobs. Obviously, we will have to talk to these countries and say, listen, but we still need to see what needs to be done about the, bank, the banking sector. We, need, we still need to see what needs to be done legally so that the investment is protected. We need also to look at the issue of uh, regulatory to make sure that things are, 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 done, are done. But let's do this. And I think the European, and, and it's good that you've asked me about the European Union, but at the same time, we should also ask, what can we do with the African Union? I think we, ha we need to keep on linking together structures that exist in the area. So European Union, African Union, Union for the Mediterranean, use all the possible tools that we have and see this, not just in a holistic manner, but proceed, proceed with it in, in this holistic manner to try and involve everyone as, as much as possible. Let us remember that even with the new development of the ACTFA, the, the free trade area for Africa, uh, unless we get involved with investing in Africa, we will be shut out of that market. So it is, it is in our interest. And something that we need to take care of, the Mediterranean, both the northern and the southern shore, risk becoming more peripheral and more marginalized. Because on the northern shore, we are at the periphery of Europe, and on the southern shore, they are at the periphery of Africa. So let's, let's have a Euro-African so solution. Great idea. So the partnership idea as a key to um, overcome or to better uh, manage the migration uh, um, uh, flows. But this brings me to um, uh, the um, part to a partnership that was not mentioned, 
and this is the EU-Turkey deal. So for, um, for most of the people assessing the Turkey, uh, EU-Turkey deal, the deal has been a success. I think uh, Mr. Vitorino has confirmed by talking about the low numbers, the crossings, the low crossings, um, via the e Eastern Mediterranean route. But on the other side, there's lots, lots of skepticism within the EU um, with regard to the idea of renewing, updating uh, the deal. So, I mean, if we need partnerships, why is this partnership with Turkey so much under criticism? I don't think it should be under criticism. I, I think, I think, uh, I think the agreement is important and it should work. Let us also remember to be fair to the Egyptians that Egypt, although it doesn't have such a, an agreement, helps to to. It's about I think five million to six million people in Egypt. At the same time, please keep in mind though that. Migration has started from the Eastern Mediterranean. It has increased in the last month, but they are not registered as the Eastern route because they're coming central. So numbers that are not being counted but as the Eastern route. But I'm talking about Syrian refugees. And no, no, I think no, the no, no. Benghazi. Clear. No, no. Now I'm talking about Benghazi. Okay. Boats have started leaving from Benghazi now, not just from the Western side. So. So I no, I think I think we should have such agreements. Not, I would say not just with Turkey, if there are parts of it that does, that doesn't work or that we are dissatisfied with, let's see what they are and address them. But we need such agreements. We need such agreements. And 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 I'll say why politically, we need to take care of both the rights of regular and irregular migrants and treat them as human beings with dignity and with their rights, definitely. But let us also take in consideration the rights of the citizens of incoming countries, because otherwise we'll have a tragic divide. Those who want the, only the human rights of migrants will take care of the human rights of migrants. The populists will take care of the rights of citizens and they will play the migration card. So let's have a realistic, you know, uh, uh, of, of, of both, and we need, such a, we, we need such agreement. Yeah, exactly, because we've been talking about revitalizing partnerships. This is also the title of our panel. Mr. Stindl Eger, would you praise the Turkey-EU deal as a role model for future partnerships? I think uh, you cannot duplicate. We said that before. So you have always to look what are special needs for a country dealing with European Union. We have this deal, we have spent two times three billion euros. Uh, it's not uh, everything finalized, but uh, the agreement has to be renewed. And um, there are still negotiations ongoing, but I think there's clear need uh, to have a next step very soon, because we have still nearly four million refugees being situated in Turkey from Syria. We have uh, a lot of uh, Afghan people trying to go over the route through Iran to Turkey and maybe from there to Europe. So I think if we don't have a partner Turkey, Europe will struggle a lot. So for that reason, I think it's needed to finalize these negotiations and to start again with a, a third phase of this cooperation. Of course, with other countries, maybe this is a little bit different. I think we have also to look to Lebanon at the moment because of situation there. To Jordan, we know about uh, all these issues about migration flows that could come to Europe also about the route through Cyprus. So I think uh, there is a challenge and I think uh, to announce this, next year will be a real year of next migration flows to Europe. So we have to be prepared. Yes. I, I, think, I think what is worrying is what's happening also, and it's good that you've mentioned uh, Lebanon and Jordan, also for the situation of the Palestinian refugees. If the agreement, if the 
funds for UNRWA, for the United Nations Relief Agency for the Palestinians, are not found, we're going to have millions of refugees in more desperate situations because they, 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 there isn't the money to pay for the salaries of doctors, of teachers, for the yes. microcredit support system. So what are we going to do? These are also going to be people who cannot have a life o over there. So together with Afghanistan and the other stable situations, uh, we need to look at this in, in the big picture. To follow up on <coughs> something each of you has just brought up, uh, a return to the, the EU-Turkey deal um, seems to me at least to, to replicate some of the flaws that the that um, Minister Almangush was talking about earlier and, and also Mr. Vittorio in terms of, you know, it's throwing money at the problem without perhaps addressing broader issues. How can we avoid, um, you know, the, the same, how can we avoid this, this model of just tit for tat money for, for preventing uh, refugee flows um, with, with future iterations of this deal or with other partnerships? Yeah, if I may start, I think uh, what we could do more in future is to look more to the details. So uh, not just to give money to Turkey that they are uh, giving this money to the refugees that they are uh, running for, for the livelihood of people, but how to create that uh, those refugees can start their new life in uh, Turkey with uh, uh, finding uh, their new company, uh, looking uh, about their skills. So we are doing at the moment a project called Enhancer where we are going not only to give uh, grants to Syrian refugees to start their own enterprise, but also to give uh, some money to uh, Turkish communities that are supporting this step forward and integrating uh, Syrian refugees in starting their new life uh, in Turkey. So I think uh, looking more to the details, how you could create a situation that uh, not only 4 million refugees are staying in Turkey, is an issue where we have to look uh, much more in details uh, how to finalize that. So, so I, 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 sorry to interrupt. We have only um, less than two minutes to go, and I, I mean, we should not leave this stage without us asking you the question about how long will the EU um, be able to watch the situation at the border uh, with Belarus? Well, the, the, the interventions that have been carried out so far, and that is where it was very clear that we need the cooperation of countries like Turkey, of Iraq, of the UAE, of Morocco. The situation is stabilizing a bit, at least compared to the crisis that we were a, a, few, a few days ago. But then it, this shows that the weaponization of, of the weaponizing of, of migrants is, is terrible. So, that is why you cannot just discuss this on its own. You have to see it even within the geopolitical uh, situation. And we need to be very strong. We need to, uh, for, when it comes to border management, we need to take it much more seriously. And humane. Definitely. No, no, definitely. No, no, def def definitely. I, I, that's why I said at the very beginning, pe treat people with dignity and, and with the humanity that they deserve, whether they are asylum seekers or regular, they are human beings. You know, that's only an adjective. Humans are a noun, not an adjective. And, uh, but then let's go deeper, let's go deeper. So in the case of Belarus, obviously one has to deal with the geopolitical issue. With the case of Libya, we have to look at the, at the southern border and also take on the human traffickers. We didn't have time to discuss human traffickers yeah. because human trafficking, one sure. of the reasons is obviously that they have become part of the economy and they make a lot of money. They make a lot of money. So we need to take that even, even seriously. Well, this has been a fascinating discussion and, and I appreciate especially that our panelists were willing to engage in solutions that go beyond the, the superficial um, as we started out with. So thank you all so much for attending. And um, in closing, I'd, I'd just like to quote uh, uh, the minister just now and what he said that you know, these, these migrants are human beings as well. Um, and that's something that shouldn't be lost in this discussion. So thank you again for coming. We appreciate it.